Yo, how's it going? How are you doing, Joe? Good morning. Top of the morning to you. Morning, Finbar. Morning, Chen. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, hash brown swag. Did you have some hash browns this morning? I had a um, breakfast burrito this morning. It had bacon. It had jalapenos, it had spinach, it had eggs, obviously. It had a Mexican blend of cheese. And it was wrapped in a high fiber content tortilla. Good morning, Alex. You had an English muffin. Did you toast it, put butter on it? Morning, MJ. Toasted and buttered. I'm too lazy for extravagant breakfast. <laughs> you gotta throw a. I mean, where's your protein though? You gotta get like an egg on there or something. Hey, good morning, Abhinav. Banjo Friday? We might have to break out the banjo. Morning, Jenna. Finbar says breakfast is the best meal. I I think I agree with you on that. Good morning, B Murph. Too much work for an egg? Come on. All you gotta do with the egg, you crack it on the counter. Preheat the pan a little bit. Crack that thing into the pan. Eggs are the best food fight? Oh, oh, eggs are the best food fight me. I see what you're saying. You need like a comma in there because eggs would also be good for a food fight. Um, but then you gotta wash the pan. And then you should probably put some oil on the pan. I can't fight you because you're right. <laughs> oh, come on, hash brown. You need to, you need to embrace the kitchen. You gotta embrace the kitchen. Pam, non-sticking oil. Oh yeah, you could just spray that on. I like cooking, just not the cleaning. I hear ya. Jenna, I had eggs today. It was a yogurt day, but I had no granola. Yeah, yogurt without granola. Just not the same. Are we talking Greek yogurt, or, or what are we talking about here? Yeah, I like yogurt with some granola, some um, pineapple, some pineapple slices. Morning, my dude. How you doing, Hank? Greek yogurt, Jenna. Yeah, good choice. Greek yogurt's a little tart, but it's delightful. You've never tried pineapple and yogurt? Well, we do... Um, do pineapple with Greek yogurt. Oh man, 
and put a little um estes i'm w wondering the story about frogweed <laughs> oh you mean uh <laughs> you mean turd weed this isn't this isn't weed like cannabis okay this is this is a totally different story okay remind me at the end of today I'll, i can tell that story that's a funny story <laughs> Chen says, quick question on homework three. It seems that the feedback graph doesn't include the gear efficiency eta. You're right, Chen. I, for that one, I just left the efficiency at one. So it's not really accounting for uh, like some efficiency losses in the drivetrain. You're absolutely right. Finbar, leftover chicken wings for breakfast? Actually, my wife does that. Um, so I can't, I can't knock that, really. Um, Siggy's Icelandic Skr is a really tasty yogurt. It's crazy thick. What kind of yogurt is that? Are we talking... Are, is this a Greek yogurt? Siggy's Iceland... Does it come straight from Iceland? It better. Icelandic yogurt. Okay, pop quiz, everybody. Let's go back to the same question from yesterday. We were divided. All right, Hank. <laughs> you get your redemption now. Down? Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> All right, redemption. You guys are redeemed. And uh, the, the way to think about this is the hairbrush model Grab a hairbrush and um, imagine this, like the tire is like looking like a, looking at a round hairbrush from the side. You can press that hairbrush onto your hand and then twist it and you'll see that the bristles flex. And what you feel on your hand when you do that, uh, the hand with the bristles being pressed into it, that's what the road is feeling. So if you're if you're wondering like what what is the force felt on the road? Okay. The force that's on the car is opposite and equal to the force that's felt on the road. It would have been super devious if you had mirrored. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, Barry. Wait, hold on. Okay, no, I see what you're saying. That's because you could have just, you could have just, it could have been a, you could have just flip flopped on your answer from yesterday. Okay, hold on. This is gonna, this is really gonna push it. Um, what a very good idea, Finbar. Which way is this tire heading? The beta or the alpha direction? Yeah, everybody give Finbar a slow clap. Okay, getting a lot of beta. Zeta, no. Okay, good, good, good. I think this is the same direction though, but, but yeah, to answer this, you're thinking, uh, you're thinking of a hairbrush getting twirled up. Okay. I believe in you. I believe in you. You got it. 
Okay. So let's continue. This is this is some stuff that we went through yesterday. And we introduced something called the slip ratio. And that is Let's bring it up. Let's bring it up really quick. I want to write that definition again. Okay, the slip ratio. This is how we define it. It's the actual angular velocity of the wheel minus what we call the free rolling angular velocity. And we went through some cases yesterday just to, just to get our feet wet, but this slip ratio tells you a lot about what situation a car is in. Like in this case, if the slip ratio was zero, um, well, that would mean that the wheel angular velocity is equal to this free rolling velocity. And this free rolling angular velocity comes from the rolling constraint that we've been using. So this would just be like something is rolling it's not sliding relative to the surface at all. Um, but this does not hold in real life. Tires deform a little bit and, and that relationship does not hold. Or rather, okay, this does hold for this fictitious angular velocity of the tire. It doesn't hold if we substitute in the actual angular velocity of the wheel. This doesn't work. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about this today. I'm gonna to run through an example. We'll keep working with it. Okay, so let's talk about how a tire produces force. So as the rubber of the tire deforms, relative to the contact patch. It stores elastic energy. So think like a spring. And this rubber, when it's deformed, it produces a restorative force, just like a spring does, it wants to get back to its original position. And this restorative force, we think of it being transmitted at the axle. So the road produces a force on the tire, and then the tire deforms, and the tire produces a force on the axle. It's kind of like this handoff. It's working its way up from the road, through the rubber of the tire, to the axle, to ultimately push the chassis. So the rubber's always trying to get back to its original shape. It's trying to unwind this twisted pattern you create in it. And so this pushes the car forward. Or uh, it can also decelerate the car and it depends on the direction of the deformation in the tire. So um, in the pictures I've showed, um, the deformation pattern lets you know which way force is being applied, but that could be in acceleration or braking. That hap you can get that same twisted up pattern with braking. Okay, so we quantify this deformation using the slip ratio and we're still getting used to to using that and what it means but what people do is we run experiments that measure the force the tire produces at the axle as a function of this slip ratio let me show you a video really quick um, we have a tire testing facility here in buffalo 
Uh, it's at Calspan, which is right across from the airport. Let's go over here. And at this tire testing facility, they have a machine that looks just like this. It looks so much like this that it makes me wonder if this was, if this video is from that facility. Last fall, we got to tour this place because the guy who runs this lab, his name is David Gentz. Um, and he was really great. He allowed us to come over. I'm, I'm talking with him right now and I'm seeing even in COVID, can we bring over a limited group to tour the facility? So maybe. I'm trying my best. But anyways, um, before we get this video started, you got this tire. It's mounted to this huge servo system. And um, so this actuates the direction of the tire. Like right now, it's kind of facing right along the road surface. But this will like rotate it. So why don't we just watch this real quick? You'll hear some nasty squealing sounds. So it's right now it's really pressing this into the road. So we got a, a big normal load on the tire. But right now the tire's facing like straight forward and there is some slip ratio here. There is some deformation in the fibers. And that's producing a force that's measured at the axle. They have like a six axis force and moment transducer in here and they're measuring all the loads. And then I think they, yeah, they start to rotate the tire. And starting next week, we're gonna get into these lateral tire forces as well. Oh, listen to the tire just screaming in agony. But yeah, we can see it as it turns, the tire's deforming. But um, from a test like this, you can calculate the tire force as a function of slip ratio. So I want to show you the graphs that come out of this. I need to close this. All right, so check this out. Um, on this axis, they have the slip ratio. And on this axis, they're getting the traction force. So th that's just the longitudinal force that the tire's producing at the axle. So check this out. As we so as we deform the tire a little bit, the longitudinal force increases. And, and think of it like a spring. It's like in this region, it's kind of like the force is K times X. Like a spring, like think of it like Hooke's law. You have a spring constant times the deformation. But in this case, it's kind of like um, our deformation we're measuring with the slip ratio kappa and the spring constant. Um, let's just say it's like K longitudinal or something. There's probably a specific term for this, but I'm not, I'm not totally sure right now. But you have like a spring constant relative to the slip ratio, at least for small deformations here so think of it like a spring now it, at some point though this becomes non-linear because um, let's write this trend the force increases as the slip ratio kappa increases but only up to kappa is like 0 0.2 or something like this. Because if you look at this graph, 
you get this maximum tractional force up here. And if you go down and see what slip ratio that was actually at, well, it's, it's like 0.2. And what that physically means is that um, the wheel is rotating faster than the free rolling angular velocity. So, so for kappa greater than zero, that means that the actual angular velocity of the tire is greater than what you would predict using the rolling constraint. And what that amounts to essentially is deformation of the tire. Okay, after this point, the force drops. So you want a little bit of deformation in the tire, but after a little bit, um, what's actually happening here is the tire isn't deforming anymore. Um, what's happening now is actually the tire is slipping relative to the road and sliding. So let's say from this point forward, tire starts to um, slide relative to the road surface. Why does it look a bit uh, like, I can't read. Why does it look like a stress strain curve? S stress strain curve. That also tells about the elastic behavior of this material. Well, okay, so you're, you know, with stress strain, you have materials that behave like a spring up to a certain point, and then uh, they reach the region of plastic deformation, right? And then they don't return to their original shape and the stiffness of the material um, decreases a lot. That's not what's happening here. So once you go over this hill, it's not like you broke the tire. It means that the tire isn't sticking to the road anymore. It's kind of starting to slide. And once you get to a slip ratio of one, We call this the tire spinning. So this is what we saw at the racetrack in Lancaster. A lot of cars at the beginning of the race, they saturated the, the static friction coefficient of the tire and it, it did something like this. It went over this hill and then the tire started spinning and you notice the magnitude of the force, once you start spinning, it's you've lost a ton of force. So we lose force when tire is spinning. And it makes sense because if the tire is sliding along the road surface, that means the rubber in the tire is deforming less because the reason the tire deforms is because it gets stuck to the road and then the wheel is turning and it bends the fiber but if the tires not getting stuck to the road then it's um, it's not deforming it's not generating force that's why it's so bad for the tires to spin they're deforming less So this is when you're trying to go forward. What about when you're braking? So notice here the force is backwards. This is a minus. And the slip ratio, this is also minus. Now when you brake, the tire goes through a similar sort of thing where your tire is deforming in the opposite direction. And as that deformation increases, the braking force increases. But then 
after this point, this is when, <coughs> excuse me, this is when the tire starts to slide. So, and over here you can see once we're, our slip ratio gets to minus one, that's the definition of a locked wheel. So over here, this is the tire deforming, which is good. Over here, this is the tire starting to slide and that's bad. And this is what traction control on a car is trying to do. You have a control system that's trying to always estimate what the slip ratio at the tire is. And it tries to deliver torque from the engine in such a way that you're always maximizing the force. So like launch control on a Tesla, you better believe there's a slip ratio monitoring system. Okay, let's do an example here. Let's try to make this a little more concrete. So let's look at this. Oopsies. So the question is going to be, what is the tractive force on this vehicle given these conditions? So let's say I'm going 60 miles per hour. I've picked a gear and so whatever gear this is, it's ratio is 1.5. Let's say my final drive ratio is three. My loaded tire radius is 10 inches. Let's assume, so this is this is a rear wheel drive vehicle, so we're just thinking about the rear tire here. Let's say the engine speed right now is 54, 45 RPM. Oh, okay, I already said this is real road drive, cool. And here is gonna be our tractive force versus slip ratio curve for a single tire. So we can see, um, yeah, around a slip ratio of 0.2. That's where we'll get the maximum tractive force for this particular tire. And this axis is the slip ratio. I used the omega symbol, but um, so that's the theta dot for the wheel. Okay, so we want to calculate the tractive force given these conditions. So first I want to propose a strategy for this problem. The strategy is to first determine what the slip ratio is from all of this information. Because once I know the slip ratio, I can go to this graph and, um, and I can figure out what that slip ratio corresponds to in terms of tractive force. So, so that's the goal. From all this information, let's get the slip ratio, then I can read the tractive force from the graph. Okay, so to get the slip ratio, I need to know the wheel angular velocity and I need to know the free rolling angular velocity. And then from that, I can, I can deduce the slip ratio, right? So. Okay, so first, given the engine angular speed, which is theta engine dot, we can determine the wheel angular speed. So from our studies before, we know that this is how fast the wheel is spinning relative to the engine. You have one over the gear ratio in the transmission one over the gear ratio at the axle times the engine speed. 
So we know this. The gear ratio from the transmission is 1.5. The axle was 3. And then the engine speed was 54.45 RPM. So if you multiply all that out, we have the wheel angular velocity in 1210 RPM. So if we know the engine speed, we know the wheel speed because they're all rigidly connected through gears. And based on the gear ratios, that's just how fast they're spinning. Okay, so we have one piece of information we need for the slip ratio. The other piece we need is the free rolling angular velocity. So this is the definition of the free rolling angular velocity. You take the road speed, you divide it by the loaded radius. So the road speed was 60 miles per hour, but that in meters per second is 26.82. And the loaded radius was 12 inches, I believe. But in meters, that's 0.254 meters. And this is 105.6 radians per second. A as I'm doing this problem, it, it reminds me, I got uh, on this most recent homework, a lot of the questions I got were resolved by just checking your units. So. Uh, I, I think the safe thing to do when you're running through these calculations is convert everything to SI units. Um, like I know when some of you were calculating the acceleration, you had torque in terms of foot pounds, but then you had other things in terms of meters per second, and that'll throw off your results. So just that's just a reminder. Uh, often a lot of these debugging issues, the first thing that I check is like, okay, I check my units. Cause I, we've all made that mistake, right? So th that's just a, a helpful tip for debugging. Yeah, dimensional analysis, just, uh, when I'm getting numbers that make no sense, that's one of the first things I check. Like, did I screw up the, and it's hard with road vehicle because we're, people talk in foot pounds, they talk in Newton meters, and so you're always having to do these conversions. So that's why I'm giving you problems that have units and all these different things, because we just have to get comfortable converting them. So, okay, so I have this in 105.6 ratings per second. That is 1,008 RPM. Okay, so, now that I have that, I can get the slip ratio. So the definition is I take the wheel angular velocity, the actual angular velocity, I subtract this fictitious free rolling angular velocity, which is what the angular velocity would need to be if this was just a free rolling body. And I divide that by the free rolling angular velocity. And if you do this, this is approximately uh, 200 over 1,000, give or take a little bit. Chen says, Haha, I thought I always made a mess on units because I'm a foreigner. Nope, it's not you. <laughs> all of us, <laughs> all of us make that mistake. It's not just you, trust me. I know a lot of you definitely ran into that same situation. Okay, so the slip ratio is approximately 0 0.2. Like in this case, the units just need to be consistent. Like I kept this in RPM divided by RPM. But if I, I could have converted this to radians per second, I would just have to be careful that the denominator is also radians per second. So just stuff like this. Okay, so the slip ratio in this case is 0.2. So I figure that out from the road speed and the engine speed and just some of the dimensions throughout the drivetrain. Okay, now that we have the slip ratio, we can go to the graph. Let's go back up. The slip ratio is, okay, it's in fact 0.2. So I go back up here, the tractive force, 
900 pounds. Okay. So, from the graph, the tractive force for one tire is 900 pounds when the slip ratio is 0 0.2. And this is another mistake that I commonly make, that you will commonly make. You have to remember that these the data is usually given for one tire because they run these tires one at a time on a testing machine and that's the result they get, right? So I have to double this for both rear tires and then it's gonna be 1,800 pounds of tractive force based on this tire data. Okay, so that's a little example of how we can bring all of this information together. Now I wanna go on to the next step. How do we incorporate this into our equation of motion? So this is what I mean here. Procedure for incorporating tractive force. This is what this is saying. Tractive force as a function of slip ratio. Why do we have tractive force as a function of slip ratio? Because these are the kinds of tire data that's available to us from people doing these tests out in industry, all right? So we want to incorporate this into our equation of motion to make it more realistic. So this is cool because um, you can simulate a car in a drag race and it's going to have realistic wheel slip at the beginning of the race. If you're not careful, I mean, you can you can play around with the torque so that the wheels don't slip, but you can run a test, a simulation to see if it will. OK, so how do we incorporate this? So first we start with our generic equation of motion. So just to remind you what this is, you're going to have tractive force at the front and the rear. You're going to subtract your rolling resistance at the front and the rear and then we got to have our aerodynamic drag. All right. And um, we're going to assume this is rear wheel drive. So this is going to be the big force contributor. OK, so. Let's look at our expression for the tractive force at the rear. A week or two ago, we did the sum of moments through the drivetrain, and we came up with an expression like this. The tractive force at the rear times the rear tire radius is going to be these gear ratios times the engine torque minus all of this stuff, all this inertia times the angular acceleration of the rear wheels. So to make this simpler, let's define this term as the as I sub DT. So in other words, the moment of inertia of the drivetrain with respect to the rear axle. So on this next line, I'm just gonna group all those terms together. I took all of that and I just put it right here. Okay, so here's where we add this new information. Or it's not new, it's just now we're including it. We know that this tractive force at the rear is going to be a function of the slip ratio. That is, yeah, that's what I'm writing here. The tractive force is a function of the slip ratio, kappa. Similarly, why don't we put this in while we're here? We know the torque in the engine is a function of engine speed and we know that from dynamometer tests you hook up an engine you rev it up and you'll notice it doesn't produce the same torque at every engine speed okay so we know that so let's substitute these expressions in here and we'll just write it out to go through this kinesthetic exercise of assimilating this into our subconscious. 
the spiritual exercise of writing this down. Okay, the torque of the engine as a function of engine speed. I drive train. Times that wheel angular velocity at the rear. Maybe I'll throw that rear in up here. Okay, so this is this is getting you know a little more complicated. I know that this is going to be a function of kappa. I know that's a function of engine speed, but we're already kind of dealing with that. So what we did previously, once we got to this point in the analysis, is we solved for the tractive force. We brought that onto one side of the equation. And further, we also used the rolling constraint. So we said, hey, I got this angular acceleration of the rear wheels. Why don't I make my life easier and say, I'm going to write this in terms of x double dot because they're related. But this you can only do if the rolling constraint is satisfied. So um, oops. But what we did back then is we solved for f of x. We put everything in terms of x dot and we substituted this back into our equation of motion. I'm skipping around here. I don't mean for that to happen. And, and everything was ultimately in terms of x and like x dot and stuff. All right. Um, but now we can't use that rolling constraint because we know that this equation doesn't hold in real life. So we can't write the wheel kinematics in terms of our translational kinematics. So basically, you have to integrate equations one and equation two separately. So what is equation one was this basic equation and equation two is this moment equation. So we have like a force equation, equation one, and we have a moment equation, equation two. And because we can't connect these through the rolling constraint, we have to integrate them separately. Okay, so here I'm gonna outline a procedure for doing this. And then I'm gonna show you an example. And, and this will be cool because you'll I, I'm gonna show you a, a simulation in MATLAB where I've incorporated wheel slip and you can see the tire slipping because I made a little animation. And this is the procedure that I used, all right? So what you do, let's say I'm doing a simulation, I'm doing a drag race, but I'm going to incorporate the mechanics of a tire. So what I would do, just define your initial conditions. Like, are we starting at rest? Are we doing a rolling start? Uh, then calculate what the fictitious free rolling angular velocity would be. And then, this is your simulation, you're going to define an initial slip ratio. So what I did in my simulation, I, it's safe to assume that the initial slip ratio is zero when you're starting a race. Because, um, yeah, let's say we're starting from rest. The tire's just sitting there. There's no deformation. There's no slip ratio. The tire's not spinning yet, so there's no slip ratio. So... But let's say you had like a just generically any slip ratio. So what you do at the start of your simulation, you're going to use this tractive force versus slip ratio curve. And based on your initial slip ratio, calculate your initial tractive force. Okay, so then you know what, what the force is at the beginning. Next, 
because you know the free rolling angular velocity and you specified a slip ratio, you can say, what is my actual angular velocity of the real of the rear tires? Because if you know the slip ratio then, and you know the free rolling angular velocity, you know how fast the tires are actually spinning. Okay, if you know how fast the tires are actually spinning, and if you know the gear ratio, so you simulating this, you're gonna choose the gear ratio, you can calculate what the engine speed is. Based on the engine speed, you can calculate the torque. Um, oh, and I wanted to, I wanted to show you this because this this simulation this this procedure that I'm showing it it's a way to simulate like a realistic car, but this is the same thing people do in video game development. Um, so think about what the 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 what information the gamer is going to be providing. They're going to provide a throttle condition. Like how, how much is the, <clears throat> is the pedal depressed? So what I want to show you is the torque of an engine changes with your throttle condition. So here we have a hundred percent. So this is when the pedal is 100% pressed you know like when when you usually do an engine test you're trying to show like oh yeah how much horsepower and torque can this engine produce and you press that pedal to the metal when you do the test you have the throttle body all the way open right yeah to the metal and so when you see the torque curves that we've looked at in this class so far we're talking about like pedal to the metal Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. But when you're doing a simulation or if you're making like a video game, you're going to want to have different settings, right? Because you're not always going to be pedal to the metal. So th this is what the torque curve looks like when pedal is 20% pressed. So... Let's say my engine speed is 5,000 RPM. All right. Well, depending on how open your throttle is, the force can, I mean, the torque can either be up here, or if you only press the pedal a certain amount, the torque's way down there. So let's go back to this. Like, Based on my wheel speed, I calculated my engine speed, and based on my engine speed, I calculate my torque, but um, you can adjust this based on the throttle setting as well. Which is, it's really cool. Okay, so given the tractive force, which we, we know from the slip ratio, given the torque, you integrate equations one and two. So equation one was the force equation. Equation two was the moment equation. And you have to do these independently. And when you integrate this using a like Euler's method or ODE 45, this predicts your next wheel velocity because I'm doing the sum of moments. And so I predict based on those moments, did my wheels accelerate? It also predicts next 
road speed. So, okay, I do an integration. I predict where my wheels are and uh, where my road speed is. And then I can update parameters based on this integration. And so what I mean is, for example, I can update my slip ratio because now my wheels have rotated and the car has also moved forward and the distance that the car moved uh, won't be consistent exactly with the rolling constraint equation. So there's going to be some slip is all I'm trying to say. So you update this. Um, and then you can iterate on this whole process. Because after you've advanced one time step, you have like a new set of initial conditions and then you can just do this all again. Okay, I wanna show you, cause, cause we have like one minute left. I'm gonna show you this example in MATLAB where I implement these steps. Um, actually it's, this example is slightly simplified um, I'm ignoring here that the torque is dependent on the engine speed. So what I do, I'm assuming that the torque from the engine for like a short period of time, I give a thousand Newton meters and then I just turn off the torque. I bring it to zero. And what you're going to see in this simulation is if I just give this torque right away, it's going to spin out the tires. So you'll see that. And then I turn off the torque, so I release the throttle. For a little bit of time, let's see, so I, I don't do anything for a couple seconds. In the tire model that I used, you're going to see the, the tires are going to spin out, and then it's going to take a little second for the tires to uh, not slip anymore. And then I turn back on the torque, but at half of the value. So it's only 500 Newton meters at this point. And this makes the tires not slip. Okay, let's let's pull this open. Let's do this. Okay. Okay, so you're going to see an animation. I have three graphs. Uh, so here on the bottom, you're going to see the tire, and it's going to roll from left to right. You're going to see... In real time, the slip ratio on the tire and the tractive force that the tire is producing. And you'll see what torque setting we're at. So I'll run this a couple times. Let's, let's do this. What is this called? Wait, where did it go? Okay, we'll have to run this again. Okay, but you can see the tire rolling. And then I apply torque. That introduces a slip. Okay, let's run this again. Okay. So you're going to see the tire, it's slipping right now, it's sliding. And now it's just free rolling. The slip ratio is zero. And then I apply torque again, and the tire's deformed a little bit, but it's not sliding. Okay, we'll watch it one more time, and then we'll slow it down. So right now it's, it's skidding. Okay, let's slow this down and try it again. Like half speed. Okay, so I applied so much torque that the tire spun out and it's still like recovering. You can see the slip ratio is working its way back. 
Now it's free rolling until I apply torque again. And when I apply torque, it's going to introduce a slip ratio. There it goes. And the force is going up in the tire. Oh, you have a question? Okay, on that note, why did we not calculate 115 new values of power and therefore torque for new engine values that were generated for each of the 15 values? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that in office hours. Um, okay, let's go back. I know we're running over time a little bit. I want to go back here real quick. Let's break this down. So... I'm starting a race, I apply a bunch of torque, and basically that amount of torque, here's the, this is the slip ratio, kappa. The slip ratio goes up to like two, and then I let off the torque, and my tire takes a little bit of time to like unspin itself. And when you think of the tractive force, as the slip ratio increases at the beginning, remember the maximum tractive force happens when the slip ratio is close to two. So like my force maxed out like really quickly. So my force uh, went up to 5,000, but then the sli the tire started sliding and my tractive force went way down. And then the tire started to undeform itself. Well, it stopped sliding. So it, I guess the tire's not really deformed here. It's just sliding relative to the road. But then it starts to stick again. It starts to deform and you get this like secondary lurch in force. So I don't know if you've experienced that, if you like spin out your tires. Um, basically, like you feel yourself sliding, you lose some force. But then if you back off the throttle, the tire like catches again and it can jerk the car forward. And then um, basically the throttle's off. Here at the end of the race, I turn on the throttle to like half power. And that sends the slip ratio to like, I don't know, it's close to 0.2. And you see the force goes up really high and it stays there. So that's why like when you're doing a race, if you just, you have to be gentle, even though your car might have like, uh, yeah, you might break the axles. <laughs> Um, even if your car has like all of this torque capability, this simulation shows like it's better if you only tap into half of that torque if you're considering the tires. It, it, it all depends on what your tires can take. So like in this case, you can see the velocity of the car as a function of time. Um, here, like the first 0.8 seconds, this is where I slammed the throttle and the tire was spinning out and my velocity was increasing, but it looks kind of weird. And then even when I turned off the throttle, the car was still accelerating a little bit because the tire was like re relaxing and then it gained some force again. And that's why it kind of shoots up again here. That's a little bit of that lurch. And then I didn't touch the throttle and the car was just rolling. Okay, but then when I applied the throttle again, but only like half of the engine torque, look, the velocity is shooting off because um, even though I'm using less torque, this brought the tire to its sweet spot where it wasn't skidding, it wasn't sliding, but it was able to deform just enough to be in that sweet range. Um, but I, I don't know, I find this stuff super, super fascinating. The, like the equations we're using, they're, they're complex, but they're not, they're not that complex. Um, 
it gets tricky because we're bringing in the engine torque that changes with engine speed. We're bringing in the, the tire forces that changes with slip ratio. But once you get the hang of incorporating these in a simulation, it's, it's not going to be too difficult for you. But you get this really like interesting behavior in the simulation that correlates back to real life. You get this situation where you slam on the torque and you find out like, okay, my tire was spinning out here. And when I do the velocity over time, I see like, wow, that didn't really help me that much. But then when I apply a gentler throttle condition, it brings the tire slip ratio into this sweet spot. And look what the force does. It rockets up and it stays there. And I see my velocity respond in kind to that. So, um, and if you want, like, you could make your own video game at this point. You could make a video game in MATLAB where you adjust the throttle. You integrate some equations. You see what the car does. I don't know. Oh. But that's basically what I wanted to show you guys today. Um, turd weed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my goodness. You guys want to hear the story of turd weed? Okay. Let's. <laughs> okay, that's, that's our road vehicle content for today. Let me tell you the story of turd weed here. Wait, let's bring back some music. We need music if we're going to be talking about turd weed. Come on. Um. Hey, Dr. S, wanted, wanted to know if you could provide more information. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ricardo. That's something I, um, that's been on my mind. So I'm going to, my goal is by the start of next week, you'll have all that information, okay? So th thanks for asking about that. It's been on my mind. Um, okay, turd weed. So I have two nephews. And they are now three years old and five years old, maybe. Very cute. But they are very into Pokemon, okay? They love Pokemon. And they, they play Pokemon Go uh, with my sister. That's, that's their mom. And um, so, yeah, er, my, my mom plays Pokemon Go. I, I haven't played it yet, but... Um, I think it's a fantastic game. So anyways, my my sister will ask each of them like, okay, who's your favorite Pokemon at this point? And you know, it might change from day to day, but Colton's very favorite Pokemon he claims is Turdweed. Now for those of you who play Pokemon, um, you're gonna be like, Turdweed? That's not the name of a Pokemon. So we're like, uh, we're like, uh, wait, Colton, like what, what Pokemon do you mean? Like, can you describe what this, cause we're trying to guess like, did, did he make this up? Uh, is he just mistaking another Pokemon that has maybe a similar name? Uh, so there is, cause we did some research, right? We were trying to figure this out. Uh, there is a Pokemon called Turtwig which is like, it looks like a little plant or like a pineapple or something. I'm not totally sure. And we said, hey, Colton, do you, do you mean, is this turdweed? You know, it's it's turdwig. And he's like, no, that's not it. And we're like, okay, um, well, 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 what does turdweed look like? And he's like, okay, it's, it's like, it's like a rat. And it has like a, uh, like a, a boomerang. And we're like, uh, isn't, isn't there's like a Pokemon with a boomerang or something and we show him that Pokemon I think it's like Cubone or like Marzipan I don't know we show him that the Pokemon with the boomerang and he's like nope and we're like who the heck is turdweed what are you talking and then like you know you ask him on different days and, and he'll just be like it's turdweed it's turdweed so what I did I drew turdweed I mean, what I think. 
Let's see if I can find this, though. I drew what I think Turdweed must be. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> okay, you're gonna love this. Turdweed. Okay, let's go here. So this is what I started with. I started with turd. You're gonna, okay, so you're gonna see the whole evolution here. The evolution of turdweed in my mind. So I started with turd. I, I'm drawing this on my, my tablet here. And then I personified it. Okay. You can't wait. Okay, because we're not we're not done yet. But he said it was like a rat or something, right? Oh, I, okay. I put a weed on its head, so it's like a turd weed. Looks like onyx. I know. <laughs> it kind of does look like a turd onyx with a uh, with like a weird plant on its head. Um. Okay, but it's it's like a rat, right? So I tried to make it into. Um, <laughs> I tried to make it into like this symbiotic uh, relationship here. I don't know, this rat and the turd are, are conjoined or <laughs> it's kind of like this scorpion tail. And um, I don't know, I put some like plants around his, some decorative plants. But then he has a uh, boomerang, if you remember. So turd weed with a <laughs> well we have matlab example or demonstration for today's content are you talking about as applied to turd weed okay and then i threw it on this killer like background so i just think that i just think that drives it home wait did i it was there any more oh yeah and then i tried to like i don't know if i combined those yet Oh man, you know, and I still don't think we've gotten to the bottom of it. Like I need to check. I haven't checked in with him. Th this was like a couple months back. Um, yeah, it was like last spring. So I wonder if he's still emphatic that it's like, it's turdweed, man. That's my favorite Pokemon. We're like, dude, we have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, Colton is really cute. He's... I'm a proud uncle. He's adorable. Um, so, so that's that's the story of Turdweed. I, ho I hope you enjoy. Just embrace those cute, fun things in life. Precious things. I know. We need to know what the actual Pokemon is. I mean, if you guys... I... Uh, I don't know because we we tried to do some research right we we looked at his description we're like is it the name did you <laughs> hey i'm glad you love this story have a good weekend mj oh uh, yeah it's funny man guys I'm, I'm glad it's friday hey good weekend have a good weekend barry this week beat me up, man. I don't know about you guys. Get him a Pokemon book for his next birthday. Google Turdweed? Is that gonna be a dangerous thing to Google? It's supposed to be nice this weekend? I don't yeah Google's not giving me Google's not giving me any info it might be Victini let's look that up there's a profile picture of a Dota 2 player named Turdweed <laughs> wait let's see um, 
Wait, what? <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, okay, this is the Dota 2 player, Turdweed. <laughs> what? Wait, what? what is that? That's a Pokemon. Vic Wait, what Pokemon is that? That's not Turdweed though, right? Jenna said, uh, last weekend, I think with Tim. Oh, this is going to be our last weekend with beautiful, sunny, and 70s. <laughs> oh, on Google Images, my picture comes up with a... Okay, this is Vic Penny. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to keep that in mind. Oh, okay, Turdweed. Turd weed. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> oh, and this is okay. Turt wig. Yeah, it, and we so we like that's what that's what makes sense, right? Like, bro, did you just Google Google? No, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't do that oh I probably did but we told him like is this what you're talking about Colton he's like no what about Oddish ooh that's adorable but but he said it was like a rat or like a gerbil or something and there was like a boomerang. Yeah, somebody said Marowak. That's. So we're thinking like. Something like this. What is Cubone? Uh, is there a boomerang Pokemon? I don't know, man. Oh, yeah, because Marowak has a boomerang attack. <sighs> man, I don't know. <sighs> Everybody, I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you can get some rest. I hope you can get some sunshine. Have a good conversation with a friend. Have a good meal. Watch a good movie. Get some good recuperation time. Hey Ben, thanks. Have a good weekend, Jenna. I'll see you guys next week. Keep putting one foot in front of the other people. One day at a time. <laughs>